Hello and welcome. I'm Pearl Chausen Bauer, one of the co-founders and organizers of Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom. As one of the forms of content that we're generating for these site, these Zoomcasts are meant to be a mechanism that will allow us to stage conversations, to think together about our classrooms practices and our, about our processes of learning and unlearning as teachers, how we can grow together as a community of scholars and learn from one another, especially in moving beyond the boundaries of our field and training. This is a third in a cluster of Zoomcasts on positionality, as scholars initially trained in a national literature that has been integral to producing fantasies of white British superiority, and most importantly, why we advocate to undisciplined Victorian studies as a way to inspire new modes of anti-racist teaching in our classroom spaces. Please note that these reflections come from our personal experiences. We don't intend to speak on behalf of others and are, not, are sharing from the position of our own identities, bodies, institutional locations, and backgrounds as a way to spark thought and discussion. Today, I'm joined by Alicia Walters, Assistant Professor of 19th Century British Literature and Culture at Penn State University Abington College to discuss her academic journey, the use of differentiated pedagogy to, treat, to reach her students, and her reflections on the changing landscape of higher education. And so thank you so much for joining us today, Alicia. Welcome thank to you UBC. Thank you so much for having me. It's oh, great. so glad, so glad to have you here. I appreciate your time and of course. you know your thoughts that our viewers I'm sure will appreciate. Yeah, that's great, so. Fire away. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's go. Great. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought it'd be good to begin with your personal journey, right? Leading up to where you are, are now at Penn State Abington. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I like the way that you discussed the fact that we were all trained in a certain way. And this, this movement much needed comes at a time where all of us uh, are really querying um, how we were trained, right. right? And how to untrain ourselves and retrain ourselves. I went to the University of Toronto for all my graduate work, and it's a deeply, you know, historic this department it still is. And so it's been a process. Um, even when I sort of step away from strict historicism, even now it feels sort of sacrilegious. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, you right. know, um, but it's, it's necessary. So in terms of how I got to where I am now, um, my first real teaching gig was at a university in Waterloo, Ontario. And the student demographic is, is completely different uh, from the kinds of students that I teach now. So initially, um, those students, it's a largely white institution where I was teaching. Um, a lot of their parents had gone to college, so there was some literacy in like what college means, it means mm. turning stuff and these kinds of things. Um, but it also meant that my way into talking about race was very different than in the American classroom in suburban Philadelphia where I teach right now. So um, the way that I would first sort of really want to introduce students to these texts when I was first teaching um, you know, a lot of texts that are deeply problematic as you talked about constructing fantasies of, of racial superiority, like Kipling's Kim, the way right. in was for me to talk about whiteness, right? And because that's something that I felt was necessary to name, but it was not easy <laughs> because mm. for one thing, I'd often get this really polite wall of silence. Um, and part of that is, I think my students, for a number of reasons, one of them being like, Canadians don't really don't talk about race in the same way Americans do. There's a cultural difference there. Um, and we have this national discourse of multiculturalism. So what that can do is actually close off a lot of querying of what race is mm -hmm. doing because the official national narrative is for multicultural. Mm -hmm. So full stop, right? So, mm -hmm. but anyway, and so also uh, I had a lot of students who just never talked about this at all. And so there would be like a, uh, a sort of shriveling up. Um, even so, we could eventually sort of have conversations, even if they were a little bit more tepid. But I found that when I came down here, even though Penn State itself uh, is a largely predominantly white institution, my campus at Abington is not. Um, mm -hmm. Most of my students are on Pell Grant. They're almost all first generation students, no matter what their ethnicity is. I think as much as like 40% identify as not white. So it's a completely different situation um, in the classroom. And so what I found in terms of, you know, shifting pedagogy in this classroom, it, it required so much more work and less work. 
<laughs> so when I came down here, I was I started teaching in 2016, which was a crazy year. And oh wow! It, it, <laughs> yeah, it's like okay, fish out of water. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> so when I I was teaching a class, I think um, uh, that I teach uh, the Victorians and race. So what it didn't require was having my students understand that race was still a thing. Right. <laughs> they were like, no, no, we're, we, we get that. <laughs> <laughs> like, sometimes before in previous classrooms, it was like, no, it's still a thing. Let me talk to you about how it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> These students, no matter what, they did not need that like buy and They're like, oh no, we get that. So there was a lot of, um, because of their lived experiences and white students too, they just were living in this um, right. environment. They just kind of saw things that, Oh, and we live in a culture in the States where we talk about things, whether right. we want to or not. So that was refreshing, but also uh, the, the kinds of connections that they were able to make because they could still see, uh, like, for instance, I would, a lot of my teaching is through primary document theory, but also we get there by primary documents, right? So I would show them stuff written in Jamaica by uh, slavers like uh, Brian Edwards or and so they would read these horrifying things uh, describing uh, the African population there. It's, you know, these still the typical things that actually construct modern white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And in their journals, um, their sponsors in class, they would, without prompting, just say something like, yeah, I heard that on a speech uh, on TV the other day. Or like, wow. so they would just say, make these connections that were. Wow. So, um, yeah, so the connections were impressive, but deeply depressing, if you know what I mean. Because yeah. Like, yeah, so that's the kind of thing that was a, a different buy-in, is what I'll say, is what, what shifted, and it made different conversations possible. Um, but it also meant that I had to do a lot of rethinking about things like relevancy, right? And yeah. so who were my students, right, in this classroom? And they they needed to see more than just blackness or brownness linked to the abject or linked to, um, you know, violence, right? And, and then so it's this instructor, you're like, well, I'm teaching one of the most violent histories in, in, in the world. So it's very difficult for me to like, I don't want to put this sort of um, kumbaya spin on things when that's not how it was you have right. this, as a structure you have this pushback of no it's my job to actually tell you what's going on right but what actually can happen in a classroom where there's more um where you have like black and brown students especially is it it's a little bit it's a lot for them and so i i so managing their own aspect when they're living this stuff every day right. and then we're reading it and it's like right. this unrelenting assault and it's like 2016 2017 2018 2020 and so it it felt sort of like how do I negotiate these two things if you know what I mean I, yeah. I think a lot of us struggle with this right right because there is emotional right I think you're talking about sort of the emotional labor too that goes into the classroom it's not just about the text I mean it never mm -hmm. is anyway or mm -hmm. it shouldn't be I think as a, mm -hmm. as a teacher, we have to be mindful about how what we teach affects our students. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like, especially with 2016 to 2020, and talking mm -hmm. about these, you know, yeah. race. I mean, was that a culture shock for you coming from Canada? Yeah. And how how did you <laughs> how did you kind of, you know, approach that as your own lived experience? I mean, you come from a, a place where people aren't talking about it and then all of a sudden it's sort of everywhere yeah I I it's hard for me to even process uh, what that felt like at that time it was really it was in survival mode a lot oh, of times because no. I was trying to find <laughs> like I was looking for a place to live with a brand new job and under these circumstances but you know funnily enough um it's when I forged some of the most important friendships that I made down here mm -hmm. and I think it's because it was one of those times when um you really kind of had to show up and um, make it clear what you stood for, right? Yeah. And so I think uh, that enabled um, a sort of realness. And also, to be honest, uh, with a lot of our colleagues in the field, um, our field is largely white. And yeah. so like in terms of the practitioners, so um, even though a lot of people I know were teaching this stuff, it was the first time 
And this goes back to the whiteness conversation that a lot of people were confronted with their own whiteness as a racial category. Yes. And I, I remember being kind of blown away when a friend of mine told me that she was walking down the street and some kids had said to her, um, hey, white lady, did you vote for Trump? And she said, no. And they were like, good. But she was like, I'm the white lady. And I, was, and I remember thinking, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I, just, I just blew my mind that that was like one of the first times that anyone had sort of confronted yeah. her with that. And that was just something that is enabled um, down here because of the structures we live in. So it was, it was interesting being on the ground floor for a lot of those conversations personally and then of course we're having this talk now because it's it's gone to our field as well right, right and so but like interrogating um whiteness as this positionality that is constructed at the same time as blackness and we're all we're all studying in fact you know the kind of not a coincidence that the two are emerging at the same time they're exactly. <laughs> exactly. related to each other right um and you can't construct white supremacy without its opposite right so right. yeah and so it was it was an interesting time, uh, to say the least, moving down here uh, in 2016. I had like a couple months before the election day and then election day, and then we all know kind of what's happened since. So. Yeah, because I think actually, you know, America changed drastically in 2016 about talking about race. I think before it probably, we did have this fantasy of, you know, the melting pot or even the mosaic and everybody getting along. And I think the silver lining of the Trump administration is really just to pull the blanket off and the mm -hmm. realities are there and people are actually mm -hmm. seeing it. Many people are, are seeing it for the first time, yeah. right? Like their yeah, right. yeah. whiteness and all these things. And so um, it was such an interesting time. I think it just, the fact that you moved at that time really just. Yeah, it, it was, it, so talk about the difference. I mean, you know, exactly. It, and so it, it's, but in a way, as I say, it's refreshing in some respects mm -hmm. to like actually be able to, to name the thing. Right, exactly. And not dance around the thing. Like, right. you don't know, see this, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can we all acknowledge that we're, this is what we see? Yeah. You know? So, you know, yeah. And then I think just going back to something that you said, which we talked about before too, and my intro actually talks about it too, right? It's this, we weren't trained to teach in this way, especially Victorian mm -hmm. studies, which is such a mm -hmm. white field still to this day. So did you feel like you had to do a lot of kind of work for, you know, within yourself and or reach out to others outside of our field? That's part of the indisciplining, right? Methodology. Uh, yeah. I mean, so in terms of the classroom, I think a lot of us may have had the experience where our students don't really know what Victoria studies should mean. So like right. that's less work for me because right. I'm doing work to whatever. So they're not worried about it. But yeah, I think um, in the last couple of things I've written, for example, I have really made an effort to um, engage with like black studies, but also 19th century American studies, like because really kind of the, the moves that are, are suggested in the undisciplining article that are needed. And I, I sort of felt like doing these things before in our discipline, sometimes reviewers might say like, well, why are you doing that? Or, right. you know, or, or sort of even I might be self-censoring thinking, well, how's that going to be received if I'm shown to engage with this scholar and right. do a lot of that because our field is so delineated, you know? Right. Right. Um, right. And so, and I think it's, that's been great to be able to do that. Um, and also just yeah, it, it makes me think about this is a, maybe something will come up later, but the idea of what we want our field to look like. Yes. You know? Yeah, it is, it's now I think I've hit my stride a bit more and I'm more confident in what I want to say um, in my own um, writing. And so I feel like making those gestures more and not being so concerned with is this visionally Victorian mm -hmm. um, has been liberating for me, frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, and I think that's what the field needs is going to survive. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it is refreshing. I mean, I think part of my work with UVC has been really um, empowering because I mm -hmm. felt like, you know, we've been complaining about our field in this way for so long and not being able, I felt like I couldn't do anything about it. You know, you go to NAFSA mm -hmm. and it's like a sea of white. And mm -hmm. um, it's not to say that we're not doing, some people aren't doing good work. Yeah. We are, but as a field, there's still this pushback, right? So totally. to, to see a lot more people being able to 
to think in these opening sort of ways it's just amazing even just having different scholars so for me the turning point like just that we might have discussed this but in, uh, there was a conference in florida st pete it was a oh, yes. outward conference that's right that's right and that was the first time that i really felt like like nafsa like okay this i could be here this feels like resonant with me and it was a great conference it's um one of my best nafsas and one of the things that also made it great was because we were in florida uh, there were more scholars from the global south that were actually physically there, uh, yeah. you know, from the Caribbean, wherever else. I was just like, why is it like this all the time? <laughs> yeah. so we're, we're even really bounded by the Northeast. So, I mean, obviously it's not, it's, you know, but it's just, it's so geographically specific within Victorian studies right. that it, it doesn't even like physically people aren't even allowed to come sometimes. So, yeah, and, exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah, and I think in our field too, there is still this, you know, privileging North America and the UK, mm -hmm. right, uh, above all oh, other. Definitely. So, you know, there's so much to be thinking about just in terms of Victorian studies, but then, mm -hmm. you know, you, you expand that to, to higher ed. And mm -hmm. we talked about that too, right? It's like, you know, the, what are the kind of questions that we should be asking ourselves now in this changing landscape or hopefully changing land, landscape of higher education mm -hmm. as faculty and scholars there is a high, I, I struggle with these questions too i think part of it is this question of what should our new or old new foundational texts be like you know what are the sort of what do we want to organize ourselves around intellectually you right know? okay um and and, and like how might that really change the field? And so I, I kind of alluded to before, but I was at a recent, um, uh, the MLA conference that was online uh, the mm -hmm. other day. And so what, what that allowed for us for me to go to a lot more panels that I normally wouldn't go to. And just being in a lot of say black studies um, panels or like uh, American panels, American panels, or just um, uh, post-colonial panels, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are all things that my work engages with that I'm, I'm doing a lot of these things, but there's never like time or space for that. And right. so what if what if we opened up or dissolved and just sort of let those things be really more integral to what we do? Of course, there's the argument that um, post-colonial studies is not necessarily out, that outside of, what, of some of what mm -hmm. we do, but I think it, it's come in fashion. And I sort of feel like um, making that much more intentional would necessitate right. that insular, um, vision of our field, like how could, how, if we were reading Christina Sharp and like, uh, like a lot of different texts, how could we remain so insular, right? So that's yeah. one question we'd have to ask ourselves, but I don't know what you think, but like, <laughs> I, I think we all need a bit more literacy with those with different kinds of texts. Yeah, I absolutely think that's, uh, that's necessary and true. And I agree with you with post-colonial. I mean, it, we, we do have a post-colonial fields within Victorian mm -hmm. studies, but it does feel more siloed, right? Mm -hmm. of, of course, we, a lot of people engage, we, we engage, there's, there's like a, there's a, an, a weaving, but it mm -hmm. still feels like it's separate thing. Oh, mm -hmm. that's post-colonial studies. And yeah, yeah, like, yeah. how do we break? I think it's true. Like how, those are the questions. Like how do we break those silos or I don't even know what it is. It's like a, people, we, maybe even we think it's like, oh, it's this thing. And then it's this thing. It's this thing. Instead, it's actually, we are all, we're all part of the same conversation. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out how to talk and work together. And it, I'm sorry. No, I'm just agreeing. Like mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. I, I was at a, before everything shut down um, with COVID, the last uh, symposium I went to was an Irish studies conference uh, organized by Mary Mellon at Villanova. And I went I was one way I'm like, where have you come in my life? This, this is actually is like so relevant to everything that I do. And I was just like on fire intellectually. And I just thought, and then I got mad because I was like, why is this separate from what yeah. we were doing? This is ridiculous. Right. Um, and, and I remember um, Amy Martin was reading a paper and she was reading, I think it was some kind of like, I don't want to misquote her, but it was kind of like a revolutionary writing in Ireland, but he was quoting Moran Bay, you know, like wow. the, the revolution in Moran Bay. Yeah. And in the 19th century, that these were united yeah. struggles, united. So where's this conversation? Right. And why do I have to hear about it in Irish studies? Context? Right. <laughs> you know, those, mm -hmm. this kind of thing, or talk about silos. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that is the question with higher education, right? Because I mean, even as a grad student, I don't know if you if you felt like you had to, I mean, we all had to pick a, p- a field, right? Oh, we yeah. had to specialize yeah. in something and then and then we specialize in something and that's our specialty, right? And mm-hmm. that's part of, and that's our training. And though we're realizing, especially for me, I, I, I teach, I'm a generalist at mm-hmm. NDNU. And so I've had to become a specialist in other things that I wasn't yeah. tra- nas- you know, trained in. Yeah, exactly. And that was refreshing for me because it actually opened my eyes and I had to do this undisciplining work without really thinking of it. Yeah. You know, it was just yeah. of necessity. At the same yeah. time, I realized I became a better teacher and scholar because, and scholar, yeah, right, because I was reading all these things. I mean, I think this comes back to your point too about literacy. I mean, I think there we do need to read and exp- like we do need another kind of training, right? Exactly. But, but how yeah. how does that work? I mean, a how do we the buy in? Mm-hmm right? For yeah, a yeah. lot more people, not just in Victorian studies, but in, in all of higher education, you know, how do we get everybody to realize the importance of that? And then to the conversations, like, um, I think what's been great about COVID, one of the silver linings of COVID are the fact, you know, is the conferences that have become virtual mm-hmm. have been so easy to attend. And, yeah. you know, inexpensive, especially if you're thinking about, you know, grad students, Equity, yeah, equity. Like we can afford to grow And I, I don't know what's going to happen post COVID, right? So I don't know. What yeah, well, we we obviously are, are, are longing for that in person contact, but it's going to replicate those things like that keep um, so many people out when we're back face to face. And and that, as you say, like that was it was refreshing that I could be in a different conversation in a different room at the virtual <laughs> MLA and like just listening to these things that are so. I speak to what I do so directly, but like I never get to because of our, our literal room silos or our discipline <laughs> silos. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and I know I don't. The question of buy-in, it's got to be at so many levels, and we are we face market pressures, right? So uh, because the field is contracting, actually, sometimes it seems like there's more desire for us to market ourselves along the older line right 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 we're we're chickens we're bronze right and so I, I one of the things I thought about is like what would it actually look like to confront say Dickens's racist legacy seriously and what would that do for our field because there's, there's a kind of tiptoeing around it mm-hmm. because of the fact that he's our most marketable you know guy right, right? and right, so right, right. um and I I don't, and so that 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 comes down to these questions of buy-in too. Like I don't know what what that would look like, or if we if, if we would face intense pushback within for trying to do those things. If, if you know, we can always see that sort of happening. So I don't know if it to what degree it's iconoclasm that has to happen, or if it's recontextualizing the people that are most identifiable in the 19th century, like, you know, to outsiders and making, say, it clear that Jane Austen isn't just, or she's not necessarily Victorian, but I'm just like a 19th right, century right, idea. Right. And making sure that like Bronte or Austen, they're not just in parlors, right? Like there's definitely right, right, right. international movement. And like, you know, there's there's much more context that contains these texts that does not necessitate us reading them in these ways. Of course, we've been a lot of us have been doing this for years, but making this more legible outside um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. would maybe make us more seemingly engaged with what's going on. Like, right. Sometimes I feel like the outside perception of what we're doing is that we're just not, you know, always as concerned with the, with the now and how do we keep touching the now without relinquishing those things that make us recognizable. I don't know. Yeah. This is the struggle. Right. And I think you're right. I mean, I, it is, it's, it's interesting. I mean, Victorian studies is, feels backwards in a way or behind, I don't know, backward, mm-hmm. behind yeah, yeah, yeah. other fields. And I have, don't, I, I don't know if it's because of what you were just saying, maybe. And, uh, and not to say that there aren't important work being done because there are. Yes, of course. And, yeah. I mean, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation if the work wasn't there already, right? There's a lot of foundational things that have happened, you know, as we've been progressing. But of I course. think we're yeah. saying now, like, we need more and we need yeah. more people 
to be doing this yeah. work. Yeah. And and I, for me personally too, like it was so easy for me to not even uh, think about race when I was doing my mm-hmm. dissertation. A, nobody was asking me to do that. Mm-hmm. And B, it was this thing like, well, I have to have a, I was, so I wrote on poetry, but I have to write, have a chapter on Tennyson. I have to have a chapter on Hopkins. It's like, I have a, you know, yeah, Rosetti. You cover these bases. Have, yeah, exactly. Yeah. To get the job. Yeah. And so I think that's so important too, in terms of having to change those narratives even at the grad level. Especially at the grad level. Especially yeah. at the grad level. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, exactly. And I, I think it's, it's going to be messy, whatever it looks like. I don't, you know, I don't have a, the blueprint. Uh, these complications are necessary. And it's going to, I mean, you know, honestly, with scholars sort of coming up now, this is really kind of, I guess, the change has to happen. Um, and there needs to be sort of a new, push for a new foundation, whatever that looks like. And of course, as we respond to pressures of the market, um, we don't really have much of a choice. There probably will be more collapsing of silos just because of budgetary things. So right. that may actually enable, like, it's kind of, it's grim. I'm, I laugh at things that are like horrible. But, <laughs> the, <laughs> but the flip side of that is that, and I think this came up in a, a talk the other day at, at MLA, is that this may actually ironically allow right, for a lot of these lateral mm-hmm. connections to be made in a way that we weren't doing yeah. um, voluntarily. That's true. I, don't, I didn't even think about that, right? It's like um, the collapse of, you know, the English department into like a humanities department mm-hmm. is so depressing to, it is. but at the same time, maybe, yeah, there is this interdisciplinary forcing, necessity. yeah, necessity yeah. that happens then. And then also, you have to really rethink your curriculum and mm-hmm. you know have to change the way that we've been thinking about english departments or oh, yeah. or everything like cool victorian stuff. studies yeah. and stuff right period exactly um, yeah so and even yeah so in the name itself victorian right so it, yeah. as we've been talking about it just it speaks to a certain curriculum exactly it's interesting because like what's victorian Last night, um, when I was, should have been sleeping, I came across this uh, genealogy website that is specifically tailored to 18th and 19th century Jamaica records because my my, mm. my background is West Indian. And then I find all like you know just this cache of things um, and family history. And but what was interesting is just these are people you know enslavers whatever they're living in Jamaica. They're writing to Scotland or wherever else and they're very much like uh, Victorian as anyone else, but that's not the, the narrative, right? It just stops. Even though we kind of, we know that things happen over there, but how, how many times, honestly, in a Victorian studies class would you bring in the letters of enslavers writing back to yeah, the home right. country? You're like, right, and right. so like, this is part of, of what it is. Right. Um, and this, this international um, movement of, of people. And I just think, there, there are still like when we call it Victorian, it's just like there's a limit to even right. what we can imagine. Right, exactly, you know? exactly. And so it's about intention, right? And it's about yeah. breaking old patterns, and it's scary. And I think it's really scary for some people because mm-hmm. I think the fear, and it is a fear. The fear is, a, oh, you're we're not teaching Dickens anymore. No, mm-hmm. absolutely, mm-hmm. we're going to be teaching yeah. Dickens because you know he's important, and I personally like reading Charles Dickens, but we have to think about teaching him in a very different way. And we have to think about the relevance in a different way. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. I I totally agree. And I think our students will continue to demand it or we won't have the students anymore. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Well, so we're almost out of time. Last thoughts or comments. I know, right? (laughs) Thoughts (laughs) or comments for our viewers. I'm, I'm always terrible at ending. I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I guess I think uh, returning back to a question more than a settled statement is uh, if we're all invested in preserving something of our field, what do we imagine that will really look like and how uncomfortable are we going to get mm. in order to get there? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a great way to end. So excellent ending. <laughs> but thank you so much, Alicia. I appreciate your time. And thank I know, so much. It's been great. 
Oh, great. And our viewers were gonna, are going to enjoy this, I'm sure. So thank you so much. Thank you.